heavily involved in uh, supporting the heritage of Florence, Indeed. Arizona, and she likes to take on these crazy <laughs> old uh, <laughs> projects that you'd better talk about, uh, talk about today. So Trish Reed. Thank you very much, Fred. <laughs> and thank you for sticking around for the rest of the day. Can you all hear me okay? Okay. Well, we are going to talk about Arizona snake oil salesmen scams and hoaxes, mostly men, but a few women here and there. Um, it really is a, a term that has a lot of different uh, other terms for it. Um, we got swindlers, horn swagglers, four flushers, quacks, illy whackers, confidence men, bamboozlers, bunco steerers, hoodwinkers, mountbanks, and charlatans. And that's not the full list, I don't think. And the mount back actually goes back to the medieval origins of this uh, process of going into a town to sell something. And these uh, early medieval mount banks, as they became to be known, would set up a little stage to sell their whatever it is that they're selling. But notice in the picture you see some um, musicians. There often was a little bit of entertainment included. So this was uh, something that would draw the public. As, as Europeans came to America, they brought this idea with them, and it kind of transformed into something like a traveling medicine show. Often these folks would have a wagon that they would take from town to town. And they also did include music. Uh, this would be something that really would draw a crowd, especially in a small town. There wasn't a lot of entertainment, so this was an opportunity to be a little bit entertained and see what was going on and connect with the outside world. Even sometimes they would make sure it was a banjo because if you've ever heard a banjo in a small area, they really carry, so <laughs> it would attract people and they would hear that and think something was going on. And they would usually send an advanced man ahead of time to the next town with flyers and posters to drum up a little excitement. So when the, the wagon pulled into town, people were ready for this. And then of course they would often uh, plant someone in the audience, a shill, who would um, testify to the uh, value of the product being sold, and then also break the ice by per perhaps being the first purchaser. Once someone bought something, then everyone else would think, well, if he bought it, maybe I will too. The term snake oil salesman has a valid background to it. The Chinese railroad workers had um, something that they brought with them, Chinese water snake oil, which was actually helpful for uh, arthritis and rheumatism because it did contain omega-3 oil. As word spread about it being something that worked, uh, it sort of spread to everyone thinking that any kind of snake could oil could do something good, even to the point of curing lack of fertility, breast enhancement, just about anything you want to name, uh, this oil could do something for you. And here's a poster for Dr. Lighthall, and a lot of these um, traveling medicine men would marry or become um, aware of what the native people's cures were and sometimes capitalize on that. I like that the fact in this one it says come immediately and be cured. It doesn't say come and be cured immediately, so there's a little lag time in there. And notice it says he's an Indian medicine man. And this Modoc oil, um, Dr. Or Mr. McKay was capitalizing on his wife being a Navajo Indian. And the little quote at the bottom says, the Navajo Indians, when they worship the great spirit by dancing the fire dance, which has caused much comment from the white people who have witnessed it, smear their bodies with clay that is first moistened with bruised leaves of the snake weed. And there really is a little plant called snake weed that has a white kind of um, fluid that comes out of it that some people say is actually helpful. If you are bitten by a snake, I wouldn't rely on it, but you never know. And then this one, the great Yaquis, uh, someone had um, met with the Yaqui people and apparently learned something. And this is again now snake oil liniment, which cured sciatica, headache, toothache, dislocations, and even deafness, <laughs> which is very strange. Uh, one of the more famous men that did this was a fellow named Clark Stanley, who billed himself as the rattlesnake king. And he would actually have live rattlesnakes on his little stage and would cut off their heads and boil them in oil and supposedly to make this elixir that was going to really work for you. And he says he learned this from the Hopi. And we'll hear more about him later on, but he was really quite famous and very productive. He sold a lot of snake oil stuff. Now, as um, these folks are traveling across the country, um, <laughs> you realize that these tonics often contain alcohol, 
even cocaine, morphine, even much as 30% of alcohol covered with something sweet that tasted good. So 30% alcohol, probably if you took a few swigs of that, you might probably feel a little better. <laughs> the problem is, is that there was no regulation about this being used on children or babies. So you can imagine some bad things possibly happening from that. And also, this is a time by now where a lot of these small towns had newspapers, um, nationwide newspapers were getting into circulation, and what happened is you could start to advertise in the newspapers and you could send away for things, and you didn't have to go in and see the medicine show or whatever to purchase these. And so medicine shows and the traveling snake oil salesmen started to decline at this point. And it really did produce a lot of competition by these newspaper ads. Notice the cocaine toothache drops there. And of course, Coca-Cola, which um, some believe originally had some cocaine in it. And then the seaweed heart cure there, the heart remedy. And of course, you could also then expand into looks as well. I love this one, uh, personal weight and personal appearance and weight gain or loss was another good um, topic to advertise for. I love the ad, are you too fat? to send away for these um, pills for you. And if you suffered from just the opposite problem, there was the fatten you up tablets or the corpula foods. <laughs> and then of course beauty uh, would get in on this. Um, this lovely um, arsenic complexion uh, wafers that you could take and enough arsenic if you took it over time would make you very pale, which you wanted to be to demonstrate that you were wealthy enough to not be outside working. Uh, if you were very pale skinned, it showed you were wealthy and uh, a lady of leisure. And then my favorite object is this little contraption over there. Uh, you put this on your head, put the little uh, rollers under your chin and pull the two strings and it got rid of this. <laughs> Actually, I kind of need that nowadays, but who will? Oh well. Just after the Civil War, there was a gentleman um, who was a brigadier general defending Pennsylvania and Philadelphia, um, Mr. Augustus Pleasanton, and he was an amateur uh, scientist, and he looked around, he noticed in the springtime when the sky was clear and the sky was so blue and the sunlight was coming down, he thought that that was blue light, and that's when everything grows, that's when the babies are being born and the livestock and the plants start to grow. So he thought blue light was something very, very special. And you probably never heard of this, but this was a huge craze across America. In 1871, he published this little pamphlet and he also created a greenhouse that he said his experiments proved that everything grew better under blue light and what he did was put blue glass in the window panes. And he also extended this into livestock. He said the pigs were more productive, had bigger litters, were healthier, and that this was really the answer to most of our health problems. The thing is, it really took off. Farmers were putting in blue glass in their barns, um, Baldness, skin ailments, insomnia, all could be cured by this blue glass. They even put it in their eye, sun, you know, eyeglasses there. Sun rooms with blue glass were being created. Light baths, which was, you could be basically go in naked probably and uh, bathe yourself in this wonderful blue light. People were so in charmed by, by blueness that they started to decorate their houses with this blue glass. They would paint the walls blue. Um, wallpaper was blue. And then you can see a company in Massachusetts was making 3,000 square feet every day to meet the demand. The price had gone up by 50%. This was huge, and although you never heard of it because it disappeared as quickly as it came along. By 1876, you think we're divided today? <laughs> no different back then because there were, there half of the country really believed that this was the answer to everything. The other half said it was all fakery and really did nothing. And they were very vocal in their positions. Newspapers would come out on one side or another. Even in popular culture, you started to have sheet music, the blue glass shoddish, blue glass waltz. This was big time. In today's parlance, you'd say blue glass had gone viral. <laughs> Here's a, a cartoon showing Uncle Sam in his home with just about everything made out of blue glass or blue. And the Chicago Tribune thought it was a good thing. The Detroit Press uh, kidded that Pleasanton was uh, being a very painstaking gentleman. Other newspapers were worried about people who blew their brains out. And the Boston Globe was a little more um, serious and uh, said the epidemic will be violent and proportionately short 
It's amusing to see people making fools of themselves, but it soon grows wearisome. And it did. Uh, by 1871, the Scientific American uh, published a series of articles debunking all of this, pointing out that if there was something good in the sunlight, you put a piece of glass between you and it, you've already cut down how much of the sunlight your body is absorbing. And so the public appetite for this completely uh, just pretty much disappeared. But it hung on in uh, several different ways. This is the 1940s um, von Schilling surgical ray, much like a magnifying glass with a colored uh, lens on it. And you would hold this between you and the light and shine that on a wound. And supposedly, this would make you um, heal up much faster. Although there was some validity to the idea of sunlight being positive, because it does have vitamin D. And so one of the things that came out of all of this ultimately was the idea of solariums and sunrooms as being a place for rehabilitation. And that's something that has held on to today. Of course, you had the Spanish flu by 1918, and everyone had to jump on that with selling things. You have Peruna there, which is, um, this was an ad in the newspapers that cured uh, the Spanish flu. And then this weird little um, um, remedy there of inhaling chloroform with alcohol. This would cure the influenza and pneumonia as well. By 1906, the for Food and Drug Act was passed, and this eventually created the Food and Drug Administration. And interestingly, um, by 1917, they finally decided to um, really put Clark Stanley, the rattlesnake king, under their um, examination. And what was interesting is they tested his oil there and reported that it contained mineral oil, camphor, cayenne pepper, animal fat, and turpentine, and not a single bit of a rattlesnake oil or part because he was so popular that he ran out of rattlesnakes. I mean, it just, there just wasn't enough rattlesnakes to um, get enough oil, and really, he didn't care. And um, apparently, I just read this fact more recently, that they fined him all of $20, which he paid, and then pretty much left the country and disappeared, but probably with a pocket full of money. But the FDA does protect us from all sorts of weird things, like this is my favorite, the vitamin donuts. And then the glasses with two different lenses, the vision dieters. And then, of course, stay fit and slim by taking amphetamine. So thank goodness the FDA is out there protecting us. Now, the difference, though, as we move forward in time is most of all these things were someone was selling you a product. And basically, you gave them some money, and they put money in their pocket by doing this. But then along came these get-rich schemes, where you were not only putting money in the seller's pocket, but you were hopefully putting money in your own. And the American West was really ripe pickings for such schemes. And here, this famous John Gasp uh, painting just shows you the American West, everyone heading out west. And a lot of people were, of course, coming to restart their lives after the Civil War. Some people didn't have a lot to go back to, um, or they'd seen a little more of the world and wanted to see even more. A lot of people were rewriting their lives and starting new by going out west. And by the most part, these were hardworking people and just looking to succeed and have a fresh start. Throw in the fact that you had Spanish exploration history in the Southwest, where you have all these legends of hidden treasure, um, even cities of gold just sitting out there. And then also add in the fact that Arizona does have a lot of mineral resources. So if you worked hard, found a good vein that was going to be productive, you could probably make a lot of money. And of course, you're uh, just coming in on after the uh, uh, California gold rush of 1849. Now, newspapers, you always want to sell newspapers. Uh, so there's always a, a little bit of both sides being published. Here you see, uh, this is a quote from an article in the Smithsonian Magazine, where it says that the rush for gold that began in California in 1848 and for silver in Nevada in 1859 filled the West with people hooked on the next big thing. And that's true. We're always looking for the next big thing. And it goes on to say how, you know, um, speculators, prospectors, everybody's heading out west, putting their money into this because the west's mountains and river bids held an abundance of mineral wealth just there for the taking. 
By 1864, one-fourth of the population of Arizona, territory of Arizona, was a prospector or miner. So a lot of people were really jumping on this wagon. Here you see a picture of the 20 mule team wagon uh, coming from the Silver King mine. And then, of course, there were other successful mines, the Vulture Mine near Wickenburg. These stories would show up in the newspaper, and of course, when they were very successful mines, everyone's thinking, well, why don't I just go do the same thing? Of course, now, Mark Twain had a comment about this. He said, a gold miner is a liar standing next to a hole in the ground. <laughs> but the West was still somewhat undiscovered, unsettled, and the source of a lot of speculation with all these tall tales and hoaxes could really get a foothold on the public's mind. And the ultimate aim for all of this was to relieve investors of their money. This is from a Prescott mining uh, um, prospectus. Come, little brother, and sit on my knee, and both of us wealthy will grow, you see. If you'll invest your dollars with me, I will show you where money grows on the tree. <laughs> little hyperbole there. One of the first I want to mention is the mountains of silver. And as I said, the newspapers... They didn't care which way it was going. If it was a success, that sold papers. If it was exposed as a scheme or a fraud, well, that sold papers too. So they, they kind of sometimes in the same article would take both sides. Here's one from the LA Star. It says, a party of armed men have started for a mountain of pure silver down in Apache Dung. We suppose this is a revival of the scheme which was on foot some two years ago. Then it was a gold mine and the rock exhibited was stolen from the vulture mine. This scheme appears to have a number of believers. Now, it sounds like they're putting a little bit of a kibosh on this. But then the very same article goes on to say, oh no, you're mistaken. The present mining sensation is anything but groundless. True, the mine is situated away down in Apache Dum, but very extensive and perhaps the richest deposit of ore in the whole world. And then it goes on, the Tucson Weekly Arizona uh, says, we found it, the greatest treasures ever discovered on the continent, and doubtless the greatest treasures ever witnessed by the eyes of man. Bankers hurry in to uh, um, get invested in this. Miners are staking claims in the area. Uh, everyone's wanting to get in on this. And this is a mine called the Mountains of Silver. It's actually uh, in kind of the western end of New Mexico, a little bit into Arizona. And ultimately, in the end, there was not enough silver to make one belt buckle to come out of this mine. Yeah, that's how all those investors felt, too. <laughs> then in 1871, you had the great diamond swindle. Now, wouldn't you want to put your money with these two fellows, <laughs> Philip Arnold and John Slack? And this is a word you hear so often. They accidentally discovered a diamond field somewhere in Arizona. It's always by accident. It certainly wasn't intentional or planned. It was just by really fate that they found this. The Sacramento Daily Union said it was down around Florence, which I've never heard anyone talk about diamonds other than the town itself being a diamond in the rough. But basically it was around Camp Verde, and um, these two fellows had somehow acquired some diamonds and a good deal of diamond dust that they had sprinkled around in the site. And here you have this article talking about how, you can, uh, how quickly you can get to the Camp Verde area so that you can cash in on this. A team of mining engineers actually went to the field, picked up some samples, and Charles Tiffany said that they were stones worth about $150,000. So in a sense, I don't know what he was looking at, but it certainly validated this claim. A lot of really important people got in on this. George McClellan, Horace Greeley, Baron von Rothschild, even William Roston, the president of the San Francisco Bank. They actually convinced these two fellows who were very reluctant to sell, but they did sell their interest in this for $660,000. <laughs> well, you know what happened. The newspapers fanned the flames, and this is one quote. It's so interesting. This is from the Daily Alta. It says, do not come here to fill your sacks and purses with diamonds, for we're not prepared to say positively that such gems do exist here, although we rather think they do. What are you going to believe? <laughs> Finally, um, a federal geologist, a man named Clarence King, comes out, takes a look, and says the whole thing is a fraud. And Mr. Slack and Mr. Arnold sort of take off. And this is exposed in the papers. Now, there's some theories about where they end up. Mr. Arnold supposedly ends up in Kentucky as a banker. 
hmm, that's interesting. He dies of pneumonia after being wounded from a shootout with a, a rival banker. And then Mr. Slack, some say, went to St. Louis where he owned a casket making companies. And then maybe some say that he went to New Mexico and was an undertaker and that he died in 1896. At any rate, they certainly did um, present quite an interesting hoax. It's so interesting that even Death Valley Days uh, featured this in 1968 episode, The Great Diamond Mines. And then, of course, you have James Addison Revis, the Baron of Arizona. This fellow attempted the largest land grab fraud in the United States history, and he got away with it for quite some time. He'd been a Missouri streetcar driver. He was very good at forging documents. He discovered this in the Civil War. Uh, he was making fake passes for his fellow soldiers so that they could take a leave, and he thought, I'm pretty good at this. He ends up establishing a claim for 12 million acres of southern Arizona and New Mexico. He had met a fellow named Doc Willing who had told uh, Revis that that he had, this Willing had acquired the Spanish land grant from a man named Miguel Peralta. And this sounds like good stuff to uh, Mr. Revis. He's thinking, oh, you know, the mind's starting to work. He sees his chance, and he decides they're going to actually join forces. And they plan to meet in Arizona territory and s travel separately so nobody gets wind of this big deal going on. Now, the story is, is that Willing arrives here in Prescott in 1874, follows his claim at the courthouse, and then legend says that he was found dead the next morning. Now, had Revis showed up in Prescott? Did he have something to do with this? We'll never probably know. But he's smart enough to contact the widow in Kentucky and buys the claim for this uh, himself. He travels to Guadalajara. He goes to Madrid, Spain. He creates a whole series of documents that really validate this Peralta claim to this land, and saying basically that this came from King Fernando VI of Spain uh, to um, a baron way back in the 1700s. In fact, he has someone make a painting of this um, supposed baron, and that this really does validate this whole line of succession to the um, Miguel Peralta claim that he gets acquired, acquiring from Swilling. And then he goes on to say that anybody's living in this land, which goes from you know, kind of western end of New Mexico clear to past Phoenix, uh, it's a big hunk of land. He says, if you're living on my property, you need to pay me. And if you want to stay there, you have to pay me. A lot of legitimate mining companies, including the Silver King, actually paid him so that they could continue to operate. The Southern Pacific Railroad paid him $50,000 so that they could still run the train across his property. He put a, up an office actually in Florence, and these small claims, like someone with just a house or a little bit of farmland, could come in and you know they could do a quit claim deed for $25 or even dinner and a drink if he was feeling kindly that day. But also, if you were resisting this, wanting to pay for what he claimed to be his land, he had a crew of henchmen or enforcers, you might say, who would help these reluctant landowners to decide to pay. And if they didn't pay, their businesses sometimes were um, vandalized, their employees beaten, crops and barns burned, and wells fouled. And I did recently research on the fire department in Florence, and when you go back to the same time, all of a sudden there's a lot of these unexplained uh, farm fires that uh, really just seem to happen. To add a more legitimacy to his claim, he locates a young Hispanic woman uh, who really doesn't have a lot of background to her, and he convinces her and everybody else that she is the last descendant of this whole Peralta line. And he marries her and coaches her how to act like a baroness. And of course, he becomes a baron by marrying her. And really, they, they were married for a while. They had these two twin boys that looked like little angels. Uh, he also was not stupid, though. He invested in a lot of other things as well. He has this going on, but he starts the Casa Grande Improvement Company, and he's going to build bridges, uh, roads, dams, irrigation canals. He's got his fingers in everything, and even getting into livestock as well, water rights. So this man really did know how to make money. And notice on his stock certificate, he, he is now J.A. Peralta Revis. But there was resistance. Uh, even some of the newspapers were starting to question whether this was legitimate or not. Even some were urging violence. Uh, in fact, anti-Revis groups were being founded. 
Even mob rule could have lynched him. I think enough people were angry about this. Of course, even down around Casa Grande, there's a lady back there that I know knows about this. Uh, he supposedly built this lovely home um, in an area uh, kind of east of Casa Grande called Arizola. Whether he actually lived in it, there's some debate, but there is a marker that there was this gorgeous home that he had um, built in this area. And just as the federal government was just about to um, honor his claim and pay him $11 million, uh, the editor of the Florence newspaper and a few other people got involved in this and said there were some things that didn't quite add up. There were inconsistencies in the typeface, the paper, the documents doesn't seem quite right. We better look into this a little more. And so there's actually a seven-year investigation by the Surveyor General of the United States, and they decide that the paper on some of these documents is too new to be authentic, that the old documents supposedly written with a quill, well, it's obviously were done with a metal uh, point. Even some of the Spanish wording is a little incorrect. There's even misspellings that royal documents probably wouldn't have had. Unmatched and unglued or glued in pages were found in Guadalajara. This whole thing is really starting to look kind of fishy. He defends himself because he you know, has a lot of um, confidence in himself, and he eventually loses the claim, and he's sent to six years of jail in Santa Fe. His wife divorces him for non-support, and there are a lot of theories about where he ends up. Some say in California that he dies in poverty there. Some say Denver, Phoenix, Mexico. Uh, what really happened to him, I'm not really sure. But what's interesting, even years later, the Florence newspaper has this quote, if anyone in the history of the territory ever knew J. Addison Revis to embark on a legitimate transaction, that discovery never come to our knowledge. <laughs> and of course, there was a movie about this starring Vincent Price as the gentleman himself. And I love this little uh, still from the movie where you see Phoenix and Florence. Florence in the big time on That's cinema. Right. And then, of course, the Spenazuma mine, another good story. Doc Flowers was a fellow that um, really got in on this, and he actually published a, a, a prospectus made out of gold. I mean, a gold cover, gold lettering. This was really something that was going to attract people because this mine contained gold, silver, and copper all at once. <laughs> and it was highly illustrated. The whole thing was quite a whole booklet that you would read about. And he's talking about how he's discovered this um, great mining property. And he says even the prospectus is actually played it down. It's much better than that <laughs> in reality. And he says there's this rock formation in Arizona that he believes is a, a profile of this Aztec prince named Spenazuma. I think it's a coined word. And that this was a lost gold mine of the Aztecs. And it's about down around southwest of Safford. He bought all these mining claims in the area and actually laid out a town. There was a railroad line as far as Geronimo, and he would really encourage investors from back east to come and see it for themselves. And this really worked for a while. And in fact, he was so smart. These investors who have heard about the Wild West and are kind of excited about coming and seeing it for themselves, he would arrange to have some cowboys attack the um, wagons that you had to take from where the train line ended and making sure that these investors would be the fellows with the guns to defend themselves. Of course, it was all um, pretend, but the investors are so excited about having saved the day themselves and being a part of Western history, they're a little more inclined to invest in this, so this was smart. Finally, um, a well-known reporter named George Smalley exposes the mine scheme as a fraud, and uh, he takes off, tries it down around Mount Graham, which is not too far from Safford, and that scheme actually got this headline in the newspapers, a second Spenazuma prospectus issued, which is one of the rankest fakes ever sent out to the public. And that pretty much caused a collapse of the whole idea. He takes off from the area, and finally he's located up in Toronto, Canada, um, and then somehow waiting bail, he ends up in New Jersey and dies from a heart attack in a New Jersey movie theater. So um, I'm not sure this guy got around, though. <laughs> I include Arizona oil wells just because when you talk about big dreams, sometimes an oil well can be a big dream. And this is interesting. This is an article really saying that the selling of oil prospects will only result in discrediting the territory, which was getting a bad record for these fake mines, even more than the selling of mining stocks that have no mine behind it. The press of the territory should shut down this sort of thing. 
Now there is one um, oil well in around Pinal County, south of town, there's an area called Deep Well Ranch Road. This is a well that went down some 18,000 feet. It cost $9 million and no oil was found. So imagine if you had invested in that. Although there are about 32 oil and natural gas wells, um, and of the over 1,000 drilled in the state, almost 90% are dry holes. So not a place to put your money, I don't think. The Cornelia Copper Mine was another big story. Uh, the native people, this is down around Ajo, had been surface mining um, copper pigments that they used in their crafts, a little bit of red, a little bit of green. Even the Spanish supposedly did try some underground mining to pull out this copper, but it wasn't a high grade, and in order to process it on site uh, would be the only way it would be profitable, because to have to ship it, to smelt it, and then um, this really just was not financially sensible. In 1900, some St. Louis men created the Cornelia Copper Company to develop this ore. And they're good businessmen, but they're not mining engineers, and they're looking for a way to process this source ore cheaply, and so it would really be something that they could invest in and would be profitable. They meet a fellow named Fred McGahan, who is selling this new process for smelting the oil, ore, which some describe as among the most bizarre ever to be floated in American mining, but they went for it, and a mining promoter named A.J. Shotwell bought into this and eventually really controls this whole Ajo district. Now, Mr. McGahan's invention was a smelter that would actually was worked on perpetual motion. Once it was started, it would continue to work, and it had this wonderful thing where you had three spigots from the ore, and out one would come the, the uh, oil, or excuse me, the copper, the gold, and the silver. Pretty amazing thing. <laughs> and... You can imagine this, well, if it worked, it might be a good idea, who knows. Around the same time, spiritualism was taking hold on America, and Mr. McGahan and Mr. Shotwell both fell under its, uh, um, these spiritualists, and they started to attend these uh, seances, and some were even held at Mr. Shotwell's house. There was this beautiful Egyptian princess that had contacted them through the seance, and actually, this one princess decided she would marry him, um, although there was a little bit of money that had to be exchanged before this was going to happen. Um, and she was giving him mining advice as well, which he was taking, which of course was not really productive. The trouble is, is these two men both sort of fall in love with one of the spiritualists and start competing for her. This becomes very vocal and becomes a public scandal. And this really does uh, chip into the financial stability of the whole operation, and things really start to fall apart. The day they're set to fire up this new smelter, Mr. McGahan says, I will, not put, you know, I will not turn it on until you pay me in cash for the work I've done. Well, I guess um, they pay him, he takes off, and then he's arrested because they said that this was um, obtaining money under false pretenses because it did not end up spouting copper, gold, and silver. Changes of ownership over the years, it became the new Cornelia Mining Company and then the Calumet and Arizona Mining Company, and finally, um, they did find a way of processing the ore that was more economical, and it becomes a full-scale mining operation, really the first large open pit mine in Arizona, and eventually is owned by Phelps Dodge, which eventually shut it down in 83. And then throw in the Spanish angle, uh, you have the seven cities of gold, Rey de Marcos, Niza's expedition, so people are thinking there's gold sitting around, Coronado, the conquistadors, they're coming to really convert the native people to Christianity, and if they should happen to find some gold along the way, well, so much the better. Even the Spanish missions, some say, had all kinds of beautiful gold um, altars and jeweled um, peace vessels for the services and so forth. Whether that's true, I really can't say. Some say that the fathers, the padres, actually got in on mining as well, um, although that's debated. But at any rate, the, the stories of this and all the wealth that was being generated by the church is starting to trickle, the word is trickling back to Spain. And the king of Spain decides then that he wants to pull this back a little bit. And he, um, there is an expulsion order of the Jesuits from New Spain and a confiscation of all this gold, silver, and jewels. 
Well, some say that though the priests did not send it all back to Spain, that they hid some of it. And one of those stories is the mine with the iron door, the lost Escalante mine. This is down around the Santa, Santa Catalina Mountains, where supposedly there was this big door hiding this vault that was, well, the native people knew about a, supposedly this gold ore and that this one priest worked it with them and that they crushed and actually smelted this into gold bars themselves, which they then hid behind this iron door because supposedly iron was coming out of the same mountain and they were able to make this um, really good fortified place to store all of this. Now there's a legend that says the Apaches raided this in 1769, wiped out the camp and blew up the door so that you'd never be able to find it. Well, of course, then everyone's still looking for it. Uh, Harold Bell Wright, an author, was down around the Oracle area. He heard about this story, wrote a book about it, which then did become a movie, The Mine with the Iron Door. And then throw in, this is all part of that same history, The Lost Treasure of the Virgin of Guadalupe. In 1933, a man named John Mitchell accidentally found the Spanish colonial document that gave directions as to where to find this whole cache of of the things that the Jesuits had hidden um, from the churches at Tumacacari. And this is a picture of the document, which even looks a little homemade to me. Um, there are various versions of this treasure that supposedly there were 2,000 mule loads of virgin silver and 900 some loads of gold bullion or 900 and some loads of the silver and gold combined. And this is all supposedly hidden in the mountains in the desert hills down in that area. Maps have turned up. The Molina is one of the more famous of them. 1937, this is the one lady I mentioned, Laura Pearson Shepley Clark, shows up in Tucson and manages to convince a lot of prominent and educated people in Tucson that she's found this whole cache of, of items. And she says she even is guarding it with a machine gun herself. And that she has invested $40,000 of her own money and she just needs a little more because she's found almost $32 million worth of gold. Uh, she just needs some cash to clear the title. And maybe if you invest with her, you will get some of this. Now you're all laughing, but it's so amazing because some pretty smart people fell for this. Herbert DeWitt Carrington was the head of the University German Department. And he said he was old enough to know better, but he still ends up investing $4,000. This is in 37, that's a lot of money. Percy Dake Biddle, who's an eye specialist that actually treated General Pershing, he goes in for $5,000. There's a lot of, not a lot of um, newspaper articles to find about this because it was played down. I mean, of course, these people do not want to be publicly embarrassed about being taken. These are two articles I managed to find which were certainly not on the front page. She is found guilty, tried, found guilty of a confidence game and sent to the prison in Florence for three or four years. Um, this is her prison register page, and it's interesting because they list her as a legal investigator and minor. <laughs> she eventually is released um, to a mental hospital, and I think the investors maybe should have been looking at that as well. Um, but it really was one story that is a little bit of an embarrassment for Tucson. Now, this is my favorite story. This is a headline from the Yuma newspaper, 1926, that says, Relics found near Tucson indicate that Roman Jews reached America in A.D. 775. Wow, that's pretty exciting. In 1924, Charles Manier and his family were on a Sunday drive and accidentally discovered these lead crosses sticking up out of the ground down around the Silver Bell mine area. He immediately contacts the Arizona State Museum and they come out and do a dig and they actually find 31 different objects which include crosses, lead swords, spear tips, all kinds of things that are inscribed with all these Hebrew and Latin quotes. What's interesting, the dates on the artifacts using Roman numerals range from about the 8th to the 10th century AD. And there are a lot of people that believe this is all very genuine. You don't want to read all this, but these are people that supposedly should have known better. They said this was a group of Christianized Jews from France who somehow find their way in 775 uh, to what is, becomes Arizona. But then another story starts to surface. A pioneer rancher down in that area says, you know, in the 1880s, there was a family that had come from Mexico and they were pretty well educated. They had just fled the political unrest. The young man of the family actually knew how to work metal. He was a sculptor and he knew the student, he was a student of the classics. 
and that some of those wordings that you see are almost exact quotes from Latin textbooks of the time. And also, the AD on the date was not really put into use until about 1000. So for it to say 775 AD indicates the person didn't know that, <laughs> and that this really pretty much disproves all of this. Of course, the argument goes back and forth, or some say that the um, degradation from the caliche and so forth could not have been faked, and some say it was. Uh, everybody's arguing about this, but ultimately, um, Mr. Manier is smart enough to sell all of this to the Arizona State Museum for a rather large sum, and they are still housed there, but you can only see them by special appointment. And then, of course, you're all laughing, but you know, imagine if you'd put your money into some of this. The Lost Dutchman Mine. There was a fellow named Jacob Waltz. He wasn't Dutch, he was German, Deutsch, and that's how the confusion begins. And he was a real person. This is a photograph of him. Um, he supposedly discovered this mine or a cache of mined ore in the Superstition Mountains that actually goes back to a person named Miguel Peralta. Is this the same one? Who knows? Um, the thing is, is he would show up in Phoenix or even in Florence with gold nuggets. And nobody really understood where he was getting these from. Um, really, did he discover this hidden gold mine? Um, there's a lot of competing stories about this, and it gets really confusing. And I've tried to um, break it down into some really quick sentences. But one says that he discovers this actually stolen Spanish gold that was coins, and that he melts that down into nuggets so he can um, then go in and say, I've discovered this in a mine. The Apaches supposedly know that there's this gold deposit and that they had worked it, and that supposedly an Indian chief had um, got this army doctor to come to the reservoir, the tribal area to help uh, cure someone of some illness, and that in thanks, when he cures him, uh, they give him a gold, they take him out there uh, blindfolded to the site where this is and give him a bag full of gold, which later he goes back and tries to locate the same place as unable to do that. And unfortunately, there really is no doctor listed in the army records by name of Thorne, so who knows. Or Waltz himself um, supposedly drew a map that he gave to a neighbor lady, Julia Thomas, just before he dies. Um, one of the uh, bartenders in the Silver King Hotel where um, Waltz would come in, he always said that the nuggets he believed were from actually high-graded ore from the Goldfield Mine, which is a little bit west of the superstitions. And then, again, accidentally discovered um, this family uh, is driving down Apache um, well, Apache Boulevard, US 60, near Apache Junction, stopped to take a little side trip and um, supposedly stumble across these uh, stones, they're called. And they've been, again, declared as fakes by some, declared as genuine. Notice some of the um, drawings and so forth look a lot like that map you just saw. Some translators say that this is, it would have been colonial Spanish, and that's not really what's appearing on there. Even the word for horse is misspelled. Personally, I think the horse looks like My Little Pony from Disney. Um, and that the, the really geometric heart is more Northern European or English than it is Spanish. But there are people who do believe in these. And uh, of course, this story um, really attracts, even to this day, a lot of interest. Many people uh, work as guides, taking people into the hills to look for this, books, articles, blogs. People come from around the world to check this out. There have been murders, uh, people dying in the hills, because it gets pretty hot in the superstitions. Even a movie with Ida Lupino and Glenn Ford was made called Lust for Gold. And I just recently reviewed this and noticed that in it they used the word hornswoggler, which I was really delighted to see. <laughs> Disney even got on, a, on the bandwagon with um, Uncle Scrooge and the Dutchman's Secret. So everybody's cashing on on this. And then I throw in the Sedona vortex, don't shoot me, but there really is such a thing as a vortex. This is a swirling mass of water or air into, which really draws everything into it. Now, Sedona was a typical Arizona town up in the nice country up there. Good movie location in the 40s and 50s. It became a destination for retirees in the 60s and 70s. But the real boom came later in the 80s with the New Age movement. And it's a beautiful area, no kidding. I mean, you just look at this picture, put yourself in there, your, your mind is going to go expand and it's also going to go inside. It's really a place that does pull you in both directions. 
1980, a lady named Paige Bryan, who was a psychic healer, an author, and a medium, is coming from a symposium on vortexes and psychic energy. And she stops in Sedona, and she looks around, and she says, I know that there's vortexes or vortices here. And she actually coins the, the term spiritual vortex, and she's written a lot of books. Once while looking at a map, she, she's really trying to discern where this other vortex might be, and she has this um, spiritual guide named Albion that helps her locate these, and he, he kind of tells her there's one over here by the airport Mesa. Well, that's great, but then they discover that it's a little too close to the runway, and somehow the vortex moves about a half a mile away. <laughs> if you believe in it, great. I'm a skeptic on just about everything, so, you know, who knows? But now there are something like 176 New Age businesses in Sedona and Oak Creek, holistic health practitioners, psychic readers, earth tours, sacred earth tours, intuitive medicine, stores selling crystals and massages. It really does attract a lot of people, and it's a beautiful area, so why not go there anyway? New Agers and the Forest Service are kind of odds because people, there are traces of original medicine wheels, but then these New Agers are going out into the hills and creating new ones, which really destroys the actual uh, site. The local conservative churches think the devils run rampant up here. Now, you, you, know, you may have a vortex at your house. I know I have one. In fact, I've been known to meditate there from time to time. I had to throw that in. <laughs> and we couldn't finish without getting into outer space. Arizona is the, the site of a really major story of alien abduction. This was up around Heber um, in the Apache Sid Greaves National Forest. Uh, there were some men that were subtracted by the, um, subcontracted by the Forest Service to go in and clean uh, some of this forest area. And it's pretty desolate. You can see it's quite a ways off the road. These fellows are in a pickup truck as they're driving along, and all of a sudden they see this thing, and there's this light coming out of it, this blue beam, incidentally, which is very interesting. Well, these guys are kind of frightened by it, but Travis Walton, one of the fellows, said, wow, this is exciting. He goes, runs out of the pickup, runs towards it, and this beam of light hits him, sort of picks him up, drops him. Well, the fellows in the pickup take off. <laughs> they just leave him there. You know, you're on your own there, Travis. And for a couple of days, he is nowhere to be seen. Well, he comes into town eventually, he says, I was not only struck by this blue light, but they took me up onto the spaceship and examined me, did some interesting things. The National Enquirer really liked this story and, and really capitalized on it. And uh, these fellows, he, he actually he and his brother were big science fiction fans, had read this book by Heinlein, have spacesuit will travel, and it's interesting because some of the details from that story are very similar to what supposedly happened to Travis. He won $5,000 as the best UFO case that the Enquirer had published. He wrote a book which was then turned into a movie. He maintains a website and has um, visits conventions about UFOs. The Enquirer later on though brought in a um, kind of a polygraph expert, and he said this was the plainest case of lying he'd have seen in 20 years. <laughs> the Enquirer did not publish that fact. And basically he said this was a youthful money-making scheme or attention-getting uh, scheme, but that there really is no substance to it. 30 years later, Travis Walton appears on the Fox game show called The Moment of Truth and was asked if he, in fact, was abducted by a UFO, to which he replied yes, the polygraph test determined he was lying. So that was embarrassing. Now, in case you're worried that this might happen to you, you can get UFO abduction insurance. Several companies offer it. Lloyd's of London is probably the biggest one. They have 20,000 of these policies sold. To receive payment, though, you have to be able to pass a lie detector test. You have to have a third party witness and or a video of the actual event. And as far as I know, no one has collected on this yet. And then we can't forget the Phoenix Lights. Phoenix Lights, 1997, 2007, 2008, these strange uh, configuration of lights that no one's really been able to explain um, appeared over the Phoenix skies. And even Fife Symington, who was governor at the time, said he saw them and they were otherworldly. Arizona has the 10th most UFO sightings in the nation, according to a recent survey. 
And uh, there's actually over 4,000 sightings according to the National UFO Reporting Center. So keep looking up, you might see something. There are a lot of other stories you can explore. Uh, the desire for miraculous healings or get-rich schemes are probably never going to disappear. The techniques and the equipment may have changed, but the methods and aims are just the same. Today, many scams proliferate. Robocalls invade our homes too often. Uh, there are scare tactics involved. Seniors and retirees are targeted in Arizona especially. Media advertising and the internet have taken up the, what the medicine shows used to do offering miraculous cures, money-making schemes, and con games. Internet hacking leaves you vulnerable. You have to be skeptical. You have to be vigilant in guarding your private information. In the end, they all want your money. So don't be a victim of snake oil salesmen or a con game or a hoax. Remember, if it's too hard to believe, too good to be true, think twice and be wary. Thank you.